Hey, Mickey. Hey, Bob. Hey, you about to hold something up there? That is Bill Murray and a Groundhog. Yeah, it's, it's a become classic a, movie. Yeah. Become a cliche and would be better if we taped yesterday, Groundhog Day. Is that why you have a coat on? Because uh, did he see his shadow? How did that work out yesterday? Jay? I, I have a coat on because because uh, it's cold here. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, but Groundhog yeah, Day, of course, movie. Groundhog Day uh, is is newly relevant because everybody. If this is in the cycle of conventional wisdom. Uh, the, the the this cycle is uh, Trump. It's going to be Trump and Biden all, all over again. Groundhog Day of the, the twenty twenty election, and it's a cycle in DeSantis may not make it. Trump is strong. He has his thirty percent base. It, I I I'm not buying it. I think I'm on the. Uh, you know the uh, the Sanders he, side. I mean, yeah. The, I mean, uh, uh, Mark Halpin said this in a podcast with the commentary people. John Ellis wrote an item. David Frum has, uh, I think, either a podcast or an item. They, they said what on the it. conventional wisdom or the dissent from what are the where the what conventional wisdom, the new conventional wisdom, which is oh my god, it's going to be Trump and yeah. Biden again. Well, David uh, from especially Trump. David from his life pretty much consists of worrying about Trump, right? Well, I, I think like, he worries like about David, DeSantis too. Gotten a lot of what? I think he worries about DeSantis too. Oh, good. And some, Does he? I'm some, glad to hear at, that. At some point, the Democrats, at some point, the anti-Trumpers are going to try to shift the focus of their opprobrium to DeSantis in order to keep the whole thing going. Uh, and uh, I don't think Frum has done that yet. But uh, I'm sure he's not like completely on board with the Senate. So wait, you're um, saying people are back to worrying about Trump. What is the logic? Now, I would think the the entry of Nikki Haley this week, the formal entry of Nikki Haley right. into the presidential campaign, would strengthen the case for Trump, right? Because the more people in it, the more Trump's rock solid thirty percent will hold up, while all the other people like right. well, fight and don't don't manage to really uh, surface. That right. really is the conventional wisdom. Yeah, uh, I like that. I mean, I don't I, I like. Don't, I don't know if implications. It's not I mean, but. I think Haley is a nothing burger. I mean, she'll pick up a few. You no, know, she. Uh, the 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 weird thing is that you know Trump's crazy theory of declaring early seems to have paid off, and that very few other people have jumped in. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, if he actually has scared people away, it was surprisingly effective. The trouble is that. People like Yunkin and DeSantis are waiting for their legislative session to end, and then they'll jump in. And I, I don't buy the argument that DeSantis is jumping in too late. The, um, you know, and 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 uh, the the the, uh, the sort of a conventional take is that if only Republicans could stand up to Trump, you know, they're repeating the cycle of they they're waiting for him to die or get run over by a car or be indicted or convicted or something. Uh, and uh, they should really, you know, when they, they should really go after him. They should. Uh, McKay Coppins had an article in The Atlantic, which I found very unconvincing, which is he said uh, he quoted some some consultant quoting Lee Atwater saying, when your opponent is drowning, throw him a brick. OK, mm -hmm. the problem is, what's the brick? I mean, it, 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 the idea that if only enough establishment Republicans said, you know, Trump really violated the emoluments clause that he should be <laughs> indicted. I mean, that that would change the tide. No, nothing they say is going to dent that 30, 40 percent vote. And it's the idea that, you know, uh, if, if, they, if, it, if it existed, they would have done it. They all want Trump to disappear. Mm -hmm. But, but there, there isn't any brick they can throw at them. The only brick is DeSantis. If you don't want Trump, you should want DeSantis. DeSantis is the brick. Is that now, there's so some obvious? Doubts of, why can't Glenn Youngkin get traction? Why, why? Youngkin could get traction. Youngkin could get traction. Well, then why is DeSantis the brick? And there but are probably DeSantis others who was, could get traction. DeSantis was conspicuously successful this past uh, election cycle. He shows the ability to rope in moderate Republicans and 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 Hispanics and maybe even some populist Democrats. So uh, mm -hmm. he he has that potential, and he's proven it. Yeah. That's that's the answer. Mickey, I have a great question that just occurred to me. What does this have to do with Groundhog Day? 
Like Groundhog Day, the movie, they repeat the same day over and over again. So we're um, repeating the same election over I've and seen, over again. It'll uh, be Biden versus Trump for the next uh, uh, 20 cycles. Oh, uh, uh, that's good. That's good. <laughs> they're, whatever it, they're paying you, it's not enough, Mickey. That was really good. What? I mean, it's, it's, it, I mean, the, the, um, the Put Horns podcast added yesterday. And oh, I tweeted okay. it three days ago. It's like, it's, it's, it's Groundhog Day is, has Groundhog Day itself. It's become the conventional wisdom. So we're going to have Groundhog Day metaphors over and over again. So it's like Meta Groundhog Day? Both, yeah, it's Meta Groundhog Day. Which is a um, reference both to metaphors and to, oh, uh, never mind. Anyway, oh. there, go ahead. Go ahead. I have a couple more. Oh, I don't, I mean, what troubles me most is the Biden part of the equation. I mean, because, any, as I've said before, anybody other than him can beat Trump. I think not anybody, but a lot of plausible well, candidates other than the, him can beat Trump. The, the the recent videos have convinced even me that he is uh, deteriorating. Well, uh, I, I he, what, what was the, there was what was the, the? There's one where he's talking about Ukraine and jets, and he gets all confused. And it's not just that he gets all confused; he just looks like he's a corpse. No, that's what I said last he's time. Doing it. That's and, what and I said last another time. One. You can but, turn but the, the volume down, and you still think he should. He should uh, leave center stage. Just watch yeah. him. Well, it's a combination. Kidding. It's the one-two punch of, I mean, it's not just a, a guy who, who loses his train of thought and has malapropism. It's a, a guy who is deteriorating. Uh, I now, mean, they've managed, they managed to do a pretty good job with him, given that he's deteriorating. I mean, the recent economic report is e extremely good news. Uh, so, but here's, here's the, here's the, yeah, a couple of new wrinkles on the what do you do about Biden? Uh, uh, Mark Halpern, who who I sort of thought was really good on this podcast, uh, put a new name out, which is Shapiro, the governor of the new incoming governor of or income to governor of Pennsylvania. Uh, not the a bad idea. The income to governor of Pennsylvania. I mean, he he's, he's he has he, an I think, income, he, maybe, I think he may be. I think he may already be in office. Okay. The, oh, uh, the, the so income, of course. I should have. The, the, he, he has he has come yeah. in to office. He's come uh, in, and everybody loves him, and he did very well. Ran a great campaign. Jewish. Uh, Always a good uh, thing. I don't know. It'd be he'd be a first, maybe not a first. You mean as a president? Wide popularity, yeah. But anyway, um, and the other name, and the other the other scenario he sketched out is first he claims that if Biden had to replace uh, Kamala Harris, he would have to do with a black woman, and that woman would be Susan Rice. I don't think. Oh you, my God! I don't know if you like that. Yeah. Oh come on! That's almost a parody. That's almost a parody of modern the frying pan into the, democratic into the politics. Like now, it's not even a question of like the overall diversity in your cabinet and administration. It's like once you've got so we should have had a black secretary of state ever since Colin Powell, according right, to this it's logic. The, it's the Brezhnev doctrine for affirmative action. Now come on, that's they never go that's, black. That's come on. Well, anyway, he said anyway, it. a lot of people think that. Uh, and and the other theory, the other more interesting theory, is the the sort of Kabbalah two step, which is Biden Biden resigns at the last minute hands the reins to Kamala, so she's president for a year. Mm -hmm. She says, this job is so important and the world is in such crisis that I cannot afford to distract myself with a campaign. So I am not going to run for office. So mm -hmm. it's going to be an open presidential race in 2024, and I'll just serve a year. So we just have to get through a year of Kamala uh, without that her destroying seems the country. completely whacked out. Wait, why does she say she can only serve a year? I missed that. The Lyndon Johnson thing. He, he, she, she has to pay, give her full attention to tending to the vast jobs, vast responsibilities of the presidency. She would do her his. She would do wonders for her legacy and history if she makes it through the year, selflessly sacrificing her ambition for the country, and uh, and it would be a good thing for the Democrats because they wouldn't be stuck with her. It's actually not a crazy strategy. Wait a second. She takes over during this term. Yeah, Biden. Biden at some point says, uh, hey, I'm out of here. I'm too old. Uh, and uh, I have this young, dynamic challenge. vice president. It's enough of a challenge to get him to say, I've served my one term. I got Trump, pushed Trump off stage. I've done my service. I'm done. The idea that you're going to get him to say, you know, at this very moment, 
I'm not capable of being president. I'm demented. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. Is, that is the sticking point with the scenario. That's it kind involve, of a sticking point. Yeah. It doesn't involve Kamala. It involves Biden. Yeah. But uh, it bit. depends how rapidly he deteriorates. I mean, right now, I think, I'm sure he thinks everything is going fine. He has Ukraine under control. He's, um, you know, he, the economy seems to be recovering in a softer landing than anybody expected. I, I think he thinks he's good to go. Uh, but anyway, it, I thought that was an a interesting... Talk. This is a test of whether the, 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 the idea of a political party even makes sense in the modern world. Are, is there anybody running the party per se? Are there elders? Are there democratic elites? Is there no, a democratic there establishment? Been, there haven't if been so, elders. Because everybody knows, Mickey, that he should go. Everybody knows been, that as a political matter, he should go. There haven't been elders for decades. Even Bob Strauss, the supposed elder, wasn't an elder when he was supposed to be an elder. I understand that it's uh, not uh, what it used to be. And in fact, that's one reason Trump got the nomination. The elders, the Republican elders didn't want him. But this isn't a challenge that big. <laughs> This is just like, can we at least get together and try to have a convert? Can they agree on the virtue of having a conversation with a guy or with his wife or something? Can they even get that far? If they can't get that far, we are in trouble. I don't think the conversation with his wife will go everywhere. We're in this bizarre position where all the Democrats want Biden not to run and all the Republicans want Trump not to run. And we're going to get Biden and Trump. That's the eventualism. Oh, oh, please, uh, Lord. Uh, please. So, because um, that's the way you get Trump. That's almost the only way you get Trump. Uh, Trump does better the more he's out of the limelight. Uh, he, he he rose in the polls when he when he faded yeah. away after the turn of the year, and uh, now he's back and he has he's mounted this ridiculous attack on DeSantis for that. That DeSantis, he he. Um, you know, he, he's guilty of pushing the vaccine, which I take full credit, this fabulous vaccine that I take full credit for. DeSantis is guilty of pushing it. He should have fought back more against this wonderful vaccine that I created. I mean, it's a completely nonsensical attack no, on I, DeSantis. And everybody knows what happened with DeSantis. And what happened with DeSantis is he shut everything down in a panic like everybody else did. But then he opened up pretty early and people give him credit for that. No, I agree that... Uh that Trump is the closest thing to the brick, you know, I mean, and as he... The saddest is the closest thing to the brick. No, no, I mean Trump. I mean, you're saying that I mean, when Trump's Trump... Brick the himself. more public he becomes, the more he, he becomes a little bit of a handicap for himself. And I would add, you know, we're a few years down the road. He ain't getting any younger. So he'll be, probably have worse judgment than well, he but had. but you have to beat him with somebody. You do have to beat him with somebody. But what I want to, what I want to add is, with Biden... OK, we got, you know, in a year, in a year and a half, he will be in appreciably worse shape cognitively than he is in now. People need to just start writing about this and writing about it and writing there, about it and not let up until stump, something. There are new people. drugs. Uh, are there? I would like some. What are they? There are new drugs that, that arrest cognitive decline sometimes. Excellent. But but you and don't be remember more what in the they future, are, right? so you never know. They don't, you don't remember what they are because it's too late for you, right? Right, I, I, right. Uh, if I wasn't in cognitive decline, I would remember. You would, them, you'd but. be able to tell me what the drugs are. Yeah, they, so um, I need a younger person to talk to about this. Yeah, I mean, often it's a cocktail of drugs, right? But I, I don't know. I mean, it, things are getting better. That it's, it's not crazy that it's an inevitable decline now. All I'm saying. Oh, there's no, there's no good. Oh, come on, these drugs like, are always I, bullshit. I lost faith in Biden's state-of-the-art medical care when his doctor put him on a Pepsi diet. That's good for some things that he have. Uh, well, it's, it, yeah, but it's the idea, it, it's, the idea, the idea that the, the cutting edge medical care is going down to the, the Rite Aid and saying, hey, what do you got for heartburn? <laughs> I mean, like, uh -huh. you think there'd be something fancier they would give the president of the United States. Plus, I've switched to Prilosec, Bob. Good thinking. Um, uh, by, by the way, there was a Washington Post piece, I think, a week or two ago, raising the question about Kamala Harris, saying some people are saying she's really not up to being Biden's heir in the event that he should decide not to run. Oh, I they're, mean, beating the, they're beating yeah. the tom-toms of doom as hard as they can, but that's not going to do the job. They should. We need a whole, you know, we need a whole new slate. Nobody could beat the tom-toms of doom better than, I think I've said this, Johnny Apple of... The New York Times. R.W. Apple of uh, R.W. Apple. Our younger, he, our younger viewers won't remember he, he that. He would name. like have 
people in the State Department on off the, on background are saying this is causing grave damage to the national security. <laughs> like yeah. they don't know how long Biden can hang on. <laughs> like, the other, the other great one. That's what we was, need. That's what we need. The other great one was when Walter Shapiro, a great guy and a great writer, he now writes for the Washington Monthly, uh, became a speechwriter in the White House. All of a sudden, these great blind quotes started coming out of the White House, like. It's Samosa's bunker around here. <laughs> like, like, Speaking of uh, Washington Monthly, congratulations gee, to Bill, I wonder who they to came Bill from. Scherer. Bill Scherer is now uh, a staffer there. I think he's political editor there. They got something. a lot of good people at the Washington Monthly now. Matt Cooper mm -hmm. is working there. I mean, mm -hmm. they... Uh, All-star team. Yeah, Paul the Glastris Washington Monthly has... At the sorry? Home. Paul Glastris is still yeah, the editor. They right? have a very strong lineup now. Um, I agree. Bill's um, co-host of uh, DMZ podcast. Uh, so um, Matt Lewis. So we have other, a lot of other things to talk about. It. I was I was hoping to put off Representative Omar until the parrot room, but we can talk about her now if you want. Now let's say a little something because it's not unrelated to something else I wanted to talk about. Okay. Uh, which which is you know Israel. There's been a lot about Israel, uh, all kinds of problems, uh, some of which we alluded to. Last week, but what's happened since we talked is that uh, Israel launched a drone attack on Iran. It was one of these special ops things from within Iran. Uh, that is, of course, uh, you know, it's an attack on a sovereign state. Violation of international law violates the exact same international law that that Russia invaded, uh, violated in invading Ukraine. Um, and uh, you know, Israel does this a lot. I mean, I mean, they they do this to Iran, they, they do some kind of attack every year or so. They assassinate some scientists, blow something up, uh, always, uh, and, and and the U.S. basically never says anything. I mean, they also they also do a lot of this by attacking uh, forces in Syria, also a violation of international law. Anyway, uh, so this time they did it while our Secretary of State uh, was in Jerusalem, and you might uh, you might ask, well, uh, did this you know make it kind of hard uh, for for Blinken to avoid finally like saying something, right? I mean, he's right. The more he's doing a press conference in the, you know, the morning after, what does he say about the attack? Doesn't mention it. He does say that he and Netanyahu had quote discussed deepening cooperation to confront and counter Iran's destabilizing destabilizing activities in the region and beyond. Now, some people would say that actually, if you launch an attack on a neighbor, that's destabilizing. But in any event, if you ask, uh, you know, why, why do you not hear more about Israel's, uh, you know, ongoing uh, actual attacks, acts of war against Iran, some of which the U.S. has actually been complicit in? Uh, I mean, a marginal case, at least. Um, part of the answer is, you know, insiders know that if you spend too much time criticizing Israel, you risk being stigmatized by the Israel speech police and called an anti-Semite. Um, and that brings us to Ilhan Omar. Uh, right. the, um, just a quick aside. Was the attack designed to protect Israel or to help us with Ukraine? Because it attacked it, drone factories and the Iranians are sending drones attacked, to Russia, right? It attacked a missile development site. And Israel, uh, tr you know, acted as if this was about Russia. The New York Times reported that it wasn't. That, that oh, well, national, I, I think they were quoting anonymous U.S. national security officials saying it was totally motivated by Israel's concerns about what the missiles might do huh, to them. Okay. And I you. just want to say, like, ballistic missiles, you know, lots of countries have adversaries that have ballistic missiles and they wish they didn't have them. But every sovereign country has a right to develop them, okay? If, if, if all of us launched attacks on all adversaries who had weapons we wish they didn't have, the world would completely blow up. And, and uh, you know, it's just, it's just kind of astounding that nobody ever talks about this. It brings us back to Ilhan Omar. There's a reason nobody talks about it. And... And, and it isn't the case that the only reason is fear of being stigmatized as anti-Semitic. But interestingly, I, you know, I looked into like, 
how she got into this trouble. Okay, so what happened in case anybody missed it? Uh, Republicans voted her off of the Foreign Affairs Committee uh, because they said she had uh, done uh, anti-Semitic things. Now, if you ask what anti-Semitic thing uh, had she done, it was, uh, you know, the, the, the famous thing she did is, well, I actually looked it up because I remembered that she had tweeted something about uh, APAC having influence because- There's a folks, list of six of them in the, in the indictment of Omar that they passed yesterday. There's two famous ones, but right. the most famous is uh, her, her, this tweet where she says, referring to the influence of APAC, it's all about the Benjamins, meaning it's all about the money. Now, I looked it up, and, and interestingly, it turns out that she was quote tweeting Glenn Greenwald, this is several years ago, who was saying, GOP leader Kevin, Mac this is Glenn's tweet, GOP leader Kevin McCarthy threatens punishment for Ilhan and Rashida over their criticisms of Israel. So apparently at that point, it was explicit, they were explicitly saying, no, you can't criticize Israel. Maybe Glenn was just interpreting it that way. Anyway, that's how it started. She quote tweets that and, 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 and writes, it's all about the Benjamins, baby. And then, uh, you know, people said, wait a second. Uh, if you say, you know, referring to money in connection with Jews is anti-Semitic. And, you know, first of all, pretty much all lobbies use money, okay, to influence things. Uh, and that includes APAC. They do it too. So I guess, first of all, the deal is apparently that APAC is the one lobby that if you just describe what they do, what we know, what is, it's true, they do, they use money and other things. Um, that's all, you know, it's the one lobby where you can't even describe what they do. You can't say they use money to exert influence because that's anti-Semitic. And I, go ahead. No, I agree. I, I, Mike Kinsey also notes that if you, uh, years ago, he went to APAC while, while people were complaining that APAC had excessive influence over a Congress. He went to the APAC website where, and where they boasted, we have so much influence on Congress, send us money. Right. <laughs> um, uh, they didn't say, and we'll use your money to bribe congressmen with, with, with uh, you know, campaign contributions, but that's sort of implicit. I, I, I looked at that list of six and wasn't impressed with any of them being particularly anti-Semitic. The most famous thing she said was not anti-Semitic was, I thought it was when she said about 9-11, some people did some things. And if you look at the actual video, she's trying to trying to make an analytic point that, uh, you know, uh, some people did some things and they right. blame the entire Muslim community. It's still a horrible way to phrase it. I don't like it. Uh, I don't particularly like her, but I don't, I, none of these things, saying APAC is powerful and has too much power, that's just not anti-Semitic. I'm sorry. No, and it's, uh, you know, and by the way, uh, you know, Barry Weiss um, is, you know, big part of the, the speech police in this regard. I mean, in her book, which I think is called How to Fight Anti-Semitism or something, she calls her an anti she calls Omar, Ilhan Omar, an anti-Semite, calls her a bigot, uh, citing this tweet and citing one other thing about uh, that Omar had said when uh, uh, when Israel was in the process of launching 1,400 airstrikes against Gaza uh, and saying Israel had hypnotized the world and was doing evil. I mean, these are, you know, again, that's, you know, so that's like a different trope, apparently. If, if, if you say that Israel hypnotizes people, that alludes to, I don't know, Council of the Elders of Zionism. There's just a bunch of things they, that you could say about any other country and people might say, oh, that's overboard, that's too far, but they wouldn't say you're a bigot. There, there are just these various uh, things that you can, you can th these forms of protection that Israel uh, has traditionally kind of enjoyed, I think less and less, I think maybe this is less effective. But the thing I want to say about Barry Weiss is she poses as a guardian of free speech. As you know, that's what she's been doing lately, right? But Mickey, surely you would agree with me. Mickey, surely yeah, you would agree with me. I'm the looking up Weiss, her, I'm looking up her website hypocrite. to see if she's said anything about, about, uh, about Omar. Well, that would be great if she, if she took back what she said before. Well, you, you, the, the, 
Yeah, it's entirely possible that she will change her mind. But if um, she doesn't change her mind, do you agree with me that she's hypocritical in posing as a guardian of free speech, complaining uh, about people who try to stifle free speech, when in fact she is integrally involved in the effort to stigmatize harsh critics of Israel by depicting them as anti-Semitic? I don't know if she's intricately involved. I think it's a misapplication of her principle. And generally, I think she is an advocate for speech. I think she has a blind spot about Israel or has had a blind spot about Israel. I didn't see anything about Omar uh, on her site. So she's not like she's jumping up and down well, with she glee. calls her anti-Semitic. I mean, she can take it back if she wants, but she put it in a book. Well, that's different. Uh, it, it, wait, it's a question. <laughs> What's different? Well, the, you can call people anti-Semitic. It's when you try to suppress their speech rights that you then become a, a, a hypocritical. No, that's what I'm saying. Speech. Is you can call uh, them anti-Semitic. That's just exercising your free speech. I think it's wrong, but it's it's not hypocritical. Right. But you understand the spirit of it is to inhibit vigorous speech about a particular country. Right. Inhibit criticism of a particular country. I, I. It's not the same as not allowing somebody on Twitter. That's different. Although that also is legal. That that's not illegal. I mean, so I don't know exactly how strong the distinction is you're making, but my point is there is somewhere on the spectrum between irony and flat out hypocrisy in making your whole identity guardian of free speech and making the other half of your identity suppressing speech about Israel. Maybe I'm exaggerating about the proportions. I'm sure there's like thirty percent of time being spent. Ninety nine point five to point five. 99.5% of the time, she is an advocate of free speech. She just has a blind spot about Israel. That's okay, but not I uncommon. Mean, it, it, I, I agree that is a less a part of her identity than it used to, but this whole book was about anti Semitism. Okay. I mean, this She's is a been, force for good, and I refuse to engage in this vilifying trope. Yeah, I knew you would. This anti Weissian trope. This is why I brought it up to get it on the record. I'm sucking um, up to her. I know you are. We're all, gonna be work, we're all going to be working for her soon. She's building an empire out here. Yeah. I'm, next, she's going to start a hospital, then an insurance company. She's already started a university. How's that going, by the way? I don't know. I people, everybody asks that question as if like it, something bad had happened to it. I don't think anything mm. bad has happened to it. But uh, I mean, she has bitten off way more than any one person can chew. Let's put it that way. But if um, anybody can chew it, she can. She's the Elon Musk of non-technical institutions. I give her a little credit for uh, slightly dissing Elon at one point when he was just going completely batshit crazy about a month ago. That took some balls. I it agree. A, yeah. Although, I mean, she was in a she was in a tough spot uh, because her, you know, she's increasingly courted a. Uh, something other than a sheerly conservative constituency, and they're very anti-Elon. But still, no, it's not nothing. Not nothing. I, I didn't think, I, I, thought she, I thought it was gratuitously uh, honest. She didn't have to say anything. Well, there was there was pressure on her to say things. But anyway. Um, okay, well, anyway, I agree with you about Omar. They shouldn't have done she's, it. Look, I don't want to act like she's uh, the main force. You know, there, there's there's... Uh, a lot of people who will work uh, to stigmatize you, including Kevin McCarthy and the Republicans. By the way, did Matt Gates finally there, uh, there chicken are, out and vote in favor of? Uh, he must I don't have know. Voted. He must have. It was a party line yeah, vote. Yeah. So, but, uh, so, so Gates, much for that. Gates showed signs of of courage, and there are a lot of people on the right who don't agree, who who sort of think Omar has a point about APAC. So I don't, you know, I I don't 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 pr pr don't present the right as monolithic. This is um. This is McCarthy playing to some sort of crowd that may not exist. Uh, you know, uh, red mega types who are diehard friends of Israel. I mean, that's they, just not necessarily well, the, even the a majority of red mega types. The, the evangelical part there's the evangelicals, of the and there's the Barry base. Weisses, maybe, and you know, and then there, and then, and then there are you know, there are Jews as well. It's a, it's it's a it's a complicated coalition, but it, it's I, collectively pretty influential. I I want to know more about o o Omar's secret affair in uh, El Segundo. That was exciting. <laughs> That's pair of material. <laughs> so, um, the, uh, they, she was discovered at some completely out of the way restaurant having a romantic dinner with somebody. Um, how dare she? Uh, exactly. So, so, I want to talk about Ukraine a little how or dare something. She? Um, By the way, speaking, one thing we could talk about that's not unrelated to what I just said. 
entirely is did you read the Jeff Girth series in the Columbia Journalism? God, uh, okay, we can we can I talk mean, about a little in the peer room. But I know, I know. It, 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 I mean, it's like what a hundred thousand words. I mean, you didn't read any of it. You didn't give him a chance. I, I sort of glanced at it and I tried to you do the thing I usually do with pieces that are too long, which is start at the bottom. So I've read the last five paragraphs, but that didn't do me any good. He was a he was a horrible writer when he was at the Times. He, the guy yeah. is incapable of concision. Anyway, we should say that this is a series about uh, how the media handled Russia Gate, basically. Yeah, it's actually better written than good. some of his things I, I'm at the Times. I'm told it's good. I'm told it's good. Well, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't go that far, but it's better written than some of his things at the Times. I mean, it, that used to be the running joke. Is he's clearly onto something? I wish I could figure out what it is. He's a good investigative reporter. Yeah. Kinsley's, um, Kinsley's rule was, if it's not on the front page and it's written by Jeff Berth, I don't have to read it because if, it, if he had come up with something, it would be on the front page. Yeah. Oh. And even then, it takes work. Let's let's put that on speakerphone, Mickey. No, it's like potential spam. My, my social it's circle. It's potential spam, my best friend. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, but did he convince you that Russia Gate was concocted by the media? I mean... I guess it made the Times and the Post look really bad, right? Uh, a little of it did, but I, I, I finally just fatigue gets the better of you about thirty thousand words in, and you I, and, and you just don't know what to think. I, I have a bunch of points about the whole RussiaGate. There have been developments with RussiaGate this past week. There was one development that I thought that the uh, right one out on, which was. Uh, Matt Taibbi had this thing about Hamilton 68, which is was taken by the press as an organization that highlighted Russian bots. Uh, but they weren't Russian bots. They were often just ordinary people who were saying things that were were pro-Trump or or you know, or did other things that mm. other that Russia wanted. And now they sort of now they pretend, oh, we never said they were bots. We always said they could be real people. Well, I think he has them dead to rights. And and I'll, I have I look for the left pushback on this and i couldn't find any any it maybe you it mean exists. the progressive pushback the left left had been on to the hamilton thing for forever oh, but, really well i, I mean do. left left i mean uh, tybee aaron Maté, you know glenn greenwald max blumenthal left, well, left. those people okay yeah, left, hey, we need left, a special left, name left, for left, them left, whatever what we need a special name for them left 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 not left 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 left, <laughs> left, 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 left. left. no they're um L L four, they're the Greenwald faction or something. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, um, and there was one from the that that the right had no response to, which which is a sleeper, which is this, this FBI guy McGonagall, I think is his name, mm -hmm. who's been indicted for taking money from Putin. Now the best response the right could come up with was, uh, well, it turns out, ha ha, that the FBI was the one that was on the take from Russia, not Trump. Well, uh, as Frum pointed out, uh, and it's, it, I can't come up with an answer for this, is, you know, this is a guy who was participating in the in the Mueller report and the effort that eventually cleared Trump of, of, from, of Russiagate, and he was on the take from Putin. Doesn't that compromise the investigation the same way James, Baker, pre, James Baker's presence at Twitter compromise the Twitter files. Yes, it does. I mean, you have to redo the whole damn investigation without McGonagall. Uh, so I, I don't know. It, that, that, that seems, it seemed like there was, it was a tie score one for one in terms of epic Russiagate disclosures. And, you know, I'm, and the one that was a total dud was the Times Durham report, which is, uh, you know, claimed that there were all sorts of horrible things about Durham. He was pressed to go after, uh, you know, go after the uh, the Russiagate people and the CIA and the FBI, and he didn't. He didn't come up with anything. That's what prosecutors are for. It's not like he falsely prosecuted them. He didn't come up with anything. He he tried to get a, a memo from Soros. He was turned down by the judge, so he used his own power and got them to give it up voluntarily. So what? Uh, yeah, it, it, um, it, it's like it was a total. The left is going crazy about this, and it, 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 there was just Don't nothing say there. Left. Say the the the, the resistance, uh, because really it isn't just the left. It's moderate 
Republican resistance. It's the resistance. And like, I know what you mean. People like Greg Sargent at the Washington the Post. The Greg Sargent faction. Yeah, the Greg Sargent. They're, they're trying to turn the, the, the Durham thing into some huge scandal to just to obscure the fact that, you know, the larger scandal, I do well, think, well, also is the, in New York the inflation Times was... of Russiagate to begin with. What? Yeah, the, the inflation time. of Russia Gate. Well, I think I, the inflation of Russia Gate. I think you agree, right? That that it was I'm inflated. Not, it was inflated. It was inflated, sure, but 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 there's still. I've always said that there was a reason for them to be suspicious, and I think sure. there's still some mystery there. Oddly enough, uh, the um, it, it was either Greg Sargent or the actual Time story made a big deal of, uh, and it showed that. Uh, or somebody, I can do it was from, from made a big deal of showing that Trump even pursued his uh, pecuniary interest in having a Trump hotel in Moscow after he became a candidate or maybe even after he became president. Well, that's exculpatory. Every, the great mystery is why is Trump being so nice to Putin? And if it's, if it's because he's so crazy about making this extra billion dollars from a hotel in Moscow, that would explain it. Yeah. You don't need a piss tape to explain or blackmail or Kopermott to explain why Trump is being nice to Putin if it's all because he wants a hotel. So that solves the mystery to me, and it eliminates the need for Russia Gate. Yeah. I mean, for uh, an actual Russia conspiracy. No, I mean, I think, uh, you know, in retrospect, uh, I don't know. There's just nothing approaching a smoking gun, uh, no, there's, and there's, it's increasingly unclear to me where one would be. And it did, and they, and they did, the FBI did, um, falsify an email in order to get a search warrant. So, but I agree with you. If you look at the way the FBI started getting concerned, you got to report some some Australian or some diplomat that he had heard this. And I mean, it, it, it was stuff they needed to look into. The other thing I'd say is, look, when you got a guy as as creepy as Trump. Of course, the establishment's going to freak out. I'm not defending it. It's just like not surprising. But it, I, I don't. I, I don't quite understand. It seems a little flimsy to me. This guy. This nobody says he overheard. There's going to be a document dump, and the campaign knows about it. Well, if you're running a campaign, you would naturally wonder: Is there going to be a document dump? It's just there. There wasn't a whole lot there. There. Yeah. Uh, you, you want to hear? To, uh, go ahead. I would have just started an investigation that Trump is saying all these ridiculously nice things about Putin. What the hell is going on? Let's investigate it. I mean, why this idea that, you know, I've that's, got what they're, that they're the FBI. They're supposed to be investigating people. Let them investigate. I've got an excellent transition from skepticism about Russiagate to Ukraine. Okay. Here it is. So the uh you know it's 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 taken for granted that uh the russians are responsible for what i gather are two separate hacks the dnc hack and the uh podesta hack i think those are two separate things anyway one i think that yeah the dnc hack is still a little up in the air i think well, yeah, that's my point. It is is I think one or both of them are, and I and and my understanding is that in at least one of those cases, uh, the government itself never even looked closely into it. It's not like we have the U.S. government uh, concluding that they did it. If you ask who con who concluded that they did it, apparently the Democrats called in a, a group called CrowdStrike, which you've probably heard of, right? Right. And, and they investigated. They're the ones who tell us that Russia did this. Here's the transition to Ukraine. On my Ukraine uh, list, my Twitter list that I follow Ukraine news on, you know, one of the people I put on there is Dmitry Alperovich, a co-founder of CrowdStrike. He's a smart guy. He keeps track of all this stuff. He has a podcast with guests who know stuff. He's valuable in that regard. However, one thing I've noticed is this guy is intensely anti-Russia. I mean, he is always so far ahead of the crowd. It's like the establishment is arguing for sending them F-16s. He's arguing hydrogen bomb, you know? I exaggerate, but it's like he, you know, he's always, he, he was arguing for F-16s, you know, when 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 the rest of them were arguing for high Mars right. or something. I mean, it's just, he he is... He's not like an hysteric like Michael McFall. He doesn't say crazy things. But I would just say 
He is a co-founder of CrowdStrike, which the Democrats trusted to find who was responsible for the Russia hack, and he is intensely anti-Putin. Those are two facts. And and uh, I think, read, read his Twitter feed, see what you think. Uh, and uh, that's, I will leave it there and use that as my huh, bridge that's to talking point. about you. That's an interesting point. Um, so you're saying he might have blamed Russia for the hack just because he hates them, or he's, he may have been I'm not biased, even, biased in a not bias so subconsciously is possible. way. I'm not, I'm not saying consciously dishonest, but bias works in okay. funny way. And I'm serious. I mean, my, my whole view of human nature is that the problem is very rarely conscious dishonesty. Uh, he, I mean, I mean, if you look, there's a, there's a Ukraine-centric interpretation of the last four years where it's all about Ukraine, starting with you know in 2015 with Trump and the machinations of the Ukraine lobby. They impeach him over Ukraine. Is that an accident? Because they care so damn much about Ukraine, they think it's the most important thing in the world. They think they can pull off a coup here the way they pulled off a coup in the Maidan. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, don't screw with the Ukraine lobby. Mm. No, it's it's a real thing, uh, and it aligns, of course, with with RussiaGate in the sense that a lot of the energy that uh, went into Democratic support of uh, Ukraine originated in in Democratic hatred of Trump and in moderate Republican resistance hatred of Trump. I mean, RussiaGate converted that into kind of the hatred of Trump into Cold War energy. Um, the, I, I want to say, by the way, I'm I'm not saying he's he's way ahead of the curve. Like I didn't I didn't know whether he advocates for these things, but he's always like having on guests who are like advocating F-16s and like explain this. Right. Mm-hmm, makes sense to me. Makes sense to me. Anyway, he's very his his uh, his position is very clear. The uh, now as for Ukraine itself, um, I think this was kind of the week where. You just saw a lot of recognition that Russia may actually get it, be getting its shit together, and that when you take the long view of things realistically, the goal maybe isn't to push them all the way out of Ukraine, but to keep them from kind of taking over Ukraine. I mean, there were a lot of uh, little things, uh, little signs of this. I mean, first of all, Ukraine. People in Ukraine are expressing more and more concern about Russia launching a big offensive. Uh, it ranges from Zelensky said, in a way, it's already underway. Other people are saying, we think it's going to happen February 24th. Go ahead. There was a powerful essay by a man named Michael McFall uh, <laughs> saying that uh, we have to act now uh, b- uh, before Russia scores some victories and America gets real war fatigue. And we pull the rug out from under the Ukrainians. Uh, so uh, time to yeah. prevent these PR disaster victories from, by Russia. So send them everything they want now. Well, there was a piece in the Wall Street Journal that that uh, said that actually a lot of the people who were who were behind giving them the latest round of weapons. And by the way, there's new new news on that front, but were actually motivated. Uh, by recognizing that time is on Russia's side. Well, the, the analogy would be the Tet Offensive, even if you know we if the U.S. claimed the Tet Offensive failed, but it had a huge impact on in Vietnam, huge, huge impact on America's perception of whether we were winning the war or not. And uh, similarly, a, a Russian offensive could technically fail and still sort of shock Americans into thinking this easy victory is not going to happen. It could, although I'm not sure that you can't get, in terms of if you want to get them more weapons, I'm not sure you can't get a lot of mileage out of a sudden fear that Ukraine's going to be overrun by Russia. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I guess eventually it flips, but I, I certainly think that a lot of people don't want to see that happen. So what, what are what are the weapons developments? You said well, they were new apparently we're going to send them, you know, the HIMARS, current HIMARS missiles go about 50 miles. They want the ones that go 190 miles. Apparently, there's a middle-range missile that goes like 95 miles. They're going to get that. I think not immediately. Um, Germany found 88 older Leopard tanks, tanks, Leopard 1s, that they're just going to give them. So now the tank count is closer to 200 than 100. I mean, it would be better if they were Leopard 2s, but you can't have everything. 
Um, and, uh, you know, th- there is a demand for F-16s. Now, uh, and I think ill-advisedly, Zelensky basically raised that like the day after the, the, the first round of tanks were committed a week or so ago. Um, I, th- I, I think F-16s, it's, it's weird, but I think drones are more important. Russia's not using that many fighter jets. Russia is using a lot of drones. And one thing people are realizing is that they're starting to use them effectively. You know, I heard a uh, uh, a thing with a, an Australian who was fighting in Ukraine, you know, as, as a mercenary or whatever, who seemed to know what he was talking about, who said, this business about the human waves of convicted felons in, Vag- in the Wag- Wagner group being the key is somewhat overstated. He said, the fact is that uh, at least some of the forces afflicting uh, Bakhmut uh, consist of, of, you know, troops that are very well integrated technologically with the drones, and uh, they're they're um, you know they're they're using and 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 I also heard this uh, same metaphor he was using from Douglas McGregor. Remember him, Colonel Douglas McGregor. Every right. once in a while, I check in with what he's saying to get completely completely terrified <clears throat> he did the trick again uh this is something he was he did like last week or something and he's saying first of all he said you know they're proceeding methodically that with uh making sure they have enough surveillance a kind of umbrella uh and, and i should note that the momentum does if it's with anybody right now it's with russia they have you know uh i can get into that a little but on the ground they're having more successes than ukraine is but mcgregor is saying look eventually Russia is going to, they have to, they still have to have regime change in Kyiv. And they, as I understood him, they'll send troops to Western Ukraine because they have to cut off uh, Poland from Ukraine, the supply of weapons from Poland. Now, if you I, ask me what could start World War III, it's Russian troops on Poland's border, because that could lead to Polish, more direct Polish involvement. Go what ahead. What about uh, uh, Ukrainian attacks on Russian cities? Well, yeah, that that could eventually, uh, you know, there's been a little bit of that. There's been these kind of special ops things, drone attacks, but uh, that could, I mean, at least on targets in Russia. Sure. Yeah. Two, I'll... two, two, two points. Um, uh, how do, how could Russia have regime change in Kiev? You mean they'd be occupy Kiev the way we tried to occupy Iraq? I mean, you need a lot of troops for that with a hostile population. Uh, I don't think the idea that they can impose some sort of Russia-oriented oligarch or kleptocrat in the presidency and have him govern, uh, you know, a Russified Kiev peacefully, that seems insane. So that's- it, it would be very hard. But I will say that, uh, you know, Russia has, here's a quote from, I think, the Times or something. Uh, Ukrainian intelligence estimates that Russia now has more than 320,000 soldiers in the country roughly twice the size of Moscow's initial invasion force. Western officials and militaries have said that Moscow also has 150,000 to 250,000 soldiers in reserve, either training or being positioned inside Russia to join the fight at any time. That's a lot of troops. Now, I, I think most people are saying that the immediate goal of any Russian offensive will be to take the Donbass completely that's mainly in Donetsk, but what McGregor is, and I, I don't think McGregor disagrees with that. Uh, but um, he's saying there's a stage two and a stage three, which is scary. And I, I would just say, you know, Mark Milley, right after uh, Ukraine uh, took Kherson City, and they had also had the big success right. in Kharkiv, Oblast, he said, "Let's stop and take stock, folks. This would not be a bad place to to get a peace deal." Because right. he 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 understood this situation more clearly than all the people who shouted him down and said, "No, no, we're going to fight all the way to Russia's borders." Would would, would 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 Russia have gone along if we'd if we pressured Ukraine into saying, "Let's start talks"? Uh, possibly not, but we don't know because I don't think we seriously explored it. And right. I will say, if you just look at who's you know, we say based on what Putin is saying, you know, people who are dismissive of peace talks say, "Look, based on what Putin's saying." Uh, they, he, they're not, they're not up for peace talks. Well, if you want to go by what people are saying publicly, right. it's the Ukrainians who seem much less interested in peace talks. Right. So, you know, 
uh, anyway, I but just you think, shouldn't go by what people are saying publicly. So. No, you what, shouldn't. The, the other question is, what would you do now? What would I do? Yeah. Well, I, I said last week. I mean, I, I I think the U.S. Well, first of all, explore peace. Use the uh, the uh, you know the the increasingly substantial coming flow of Western weapons to say to the Russians, look, it's in everybody's interest to stop this now because we'll go, uh, you know, we're going to keep this up a long time. And let's talk. And then, you know, say to you, we definitely have leverage with the Ukrainians. I mean, if we we actually want to use it, I mean, they are hopeless. Uh, They have no hope without us. Uh, There are people who think it's like immoral or something to use leverage you have. Well, okay, we could have that argument, but we have leverage. And uh, I would explore that um, very seriously. Uh, you know, one one more thing about, uh, I mean, I wouldn't give them F-16s. I was going to say, it seems, if you, if you want to be cynical and ask, why is Ukraine making a big deal of F-16s when it looks like actually more better drones would be much more valuable? You know, F-16s, uh, are uh, the th- are are a kind of weapon that I think it has the most has a lot of potential to draw NATO into the war, just almost inherently. And if you look at various kinds of shit that could happen, if you look at the ex- how conspicuous our involvement would be in terms of training, providing, and just what can happen with fighter jets, um, what they can do, what Ukraine can do to Russia with them, blah blah blah. Uh, what what kinds of mis- mishaps can happen? And look, Ukraine wants NATO to get into it. I don't I don't blame them for that. Uh, it, it's you know I would if I was Ukraine I'd want NATO to get involved. Uh, but do. but if you want to be cynical about why you're getting so much emphasis about right. F-16s, right? That's but, the cynical explanation. But Biden didn't give them F-16s, right? He said well he, he said no he said no about everything that he has now given them. I mean. Right, but as they stand now with the no F-16s, is we don't know what Biden's telling them in private. Is there any indication he isn't doing exactly what you want him to do? How do I know the Biden administration isn't seeking uh, some kind of peace deal? Well, uh, Bill Burns, who's head of the CIA and whose judgment I respect, uh, he, of course, was ambassador to Moscow. In 2008, famously warned the Bush administration against encouraging Ukraine to seek NATO membership. Bush ignored him. He he is said to have endeared himself, Burns is, to the Ukrainians by telling them he doesn't think uh, Putin is ready to talk peace. Now, if that's his honest judgment, I I, I would uh, you know attach a lot of credence to that. Uh, it's not inconceivable that to some extent. He's trying to establish credibility with the Ukrainians and waiting for the right moment. What's the downside of giving it a try? Well, again, there there isn't one. There, there's not one, and and I I haven't heard any reports that anyone has put out feelers to Putin. There's always a little more going on in these sheet than uh, than you see. There must be someone associated with the oh. administration talking to someone in the Russian administration, or at least kind of so called track two. The, uh, communication where it's somebody not in the government talking to somebody, the, you know, whatever. The, the downside would be it would be interpreted by Putin as a sign of weakness. If you if you want negotiations, people say, "Well, you, well I have you on the ropes." I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, I suppose. But uh, you know, again, we got a big weapons flow heading into Ukraine. We're pretty committed to that. And you can credibly say, you know, we're willing to play hardball. It's just uh, it would be right. easier on both of us if this didn't. We didn't risk World War Three. Right. Um, so anyway, I don't know. Let me quickly say, on, in terms of uh, battlefield developments, uh, the Russia, to the extent that either side is progressing, it seems to be Russia. Uh, there's more and more of what looks like a coming encirclement of Bakhmut, uh, much contested town. A lot, you know, a lot of people are saying, why doesn't Ukraine get its troops out of there? Doesn't make sense to sacrifice anymore. The end is inevitable. Um, and and the argument they make, and kind of the good news is, you know, there is this important line of defense loosely associated with Bakhmut. It is 
the next to last line of defense between the Russians and the Dnipro River, and apparently it's the more formidable one. But it is actually a mile or two west of Bakhmut, and it's on slightly elevated ground. So for Russia to have Bakhmut is far from guaranteeing that they break through that line there, at least. Um, and in fact, you know, I would say given that um, probably pretty much all of the pro-Ukrainian civilians are leaving Bakhmut, and you'll wind up with just a couple thousand pro-Russian civilians there, um, or a few thousand or something, I would imagine the Ukrainians wouldn't be all that cautious about uh, shelling the town. And so it could be a pretty unpleasant place for the Russian troops well, to be. There's um, all this talk about invading Crimea or attacking Crimea. And uh, I was, at first I thought that was insane because Crimea really, the I don't, I don't, I've never bought the idea that Crimea shouldn't be part of Russia. But on the other hand, it might scare the hell out of the Russians, which would be the, a good thing, even if you, even if Ukraine didn't really want to occupy, reoccupy uh, Crimea, it would be, um, it might be a good, good, uh, you know, negotiating tactic. And also, I just learned that it's, Crimea's importance is also in part because they're large deposits of something that's really valuable there. I forget if it was gas or natural gas or minerals or, you know, uh, important, important, uh, you know, metals for batteries or something. But there's, minerals? It's, not, it's not like they're, it's not like they're fighting just about a military base. They're fighting about a huge mother load of valuable shit. So, um, well, yeah, but it's not like Russia's fighting about, you mean Russia? I mean, well, the, 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 whoever gets you Crimea gets to control the mineral, the, the deposits. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, also Russia feels uh, a stronger historical connection to Crimea, which again was right. part of the Russian Republic within right. the Soviet Union until the fifties. And, and 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 I mean, just in terms of, I'm not justifying it, but in terms of how hard you can expect Russia to fight, and whether you can expect them to actually consider it their territory, and and thus, uh, you know, make some kind of nuclear thing more likely, they feel pretty attached to Crimea. The other thing is. Most of the people in, in Crimea don't want to be governed by Ukraine. Well, they want to be governed by Russia. So that's why I was thinking it might be effective because they said, oh my God, they're going after our crown jewel. Now we might we might even lose Crimea. Well, we as, better I said last week, now. as I said last week, the reports that the Biden administration is now maybe green lighting some strikes on Crimea also say that the Biden administration just wants to use this as leverage doesn't want Ukraine to actually try to take Crimea. Well, okay, but I would encourage you to really respect that line. And again, I mean, Crimea is just a dicey thing. I'll also say that uh, the there's a report in Politico that uh, Pentagon officials briefed Congress last week and said there's no chance of taking Crimea anytime soon. This kind of attitude pisses the Ukrainians off, but that's what it, this was a private briefing. This was but, but Politico reported this. I mean, it was it was behind closed doors. Um, you know, and again, there's more of a sense that, uh, developing over the last couple of weeks is, wait a second, why don't we put on hold the idea of expelling Russian troops from Ukraine and just try to make sure they do not sweep across Ukraine? And I don't mean that's what happened soon, the actual sweeping across, but in addition to the Bakhmut thing, they've been launching this offensive around this place, Vuladar, which has more, in, it's to the south, closer to Crimea, has more intrinsic importance than Bakhmut has. I mean, the, again, the defensive line west of Bakhmut does have importance. Bakhmut, per se, less. Vuladar is very important, apparently. And, uh, and you know, it's a, a, a trans, transit hub and possibly the gateway to the north for Russia and so on. The, the outcome of that is very unclear. You're hearing reports on both sides. A lot of people are dying. Uh, so I'm not predicting that Russia wins there, but they're the ones mounting the offensive, not Ukraine. And and this is a kind of disturbing thing across the board, even in places uh, like a village called Kremina or something that uh, where you were hearing about Ukraine being on the offensive. It, it's more and more like they, they're just hoping to save off Russian offensives. So we'll see. That's just this week. Things change. It was an article by uh, Jonah Goldberg uh, about how this uh, the war in Ukraine serves America's security interests because it strikes a blow against Russia. 
And that's, that seemed wa- very off to me. I mean, why is it so important for us to strike a blow against Russia? China is the big problem, not not Russia. I don't know, I don't but know. I just realized I had a dream about Jonah Goldberg last night. Now I can't oh, great. Remember. I can't remember. I'll try to recall it. That's definitely parrot room material. For the parrot room, but I don't know that I... We were on good terms. I like John. I like him too. I just, I just don't understand. It's like one of these things about asserting dominance over the Middle East, asserting influence. I don't care that much about influence on the Middle East. I don't care that much about influence on Russia. Well, I care it, about containing China. It just sounds like a zero sum. Oh, we can also talk about the Chinese weather balloon. Right. They call it a weather balloon. Chinese call it a weather balloon. They would say that, wouldn't they, Mickey? Um, um, it, exactly. That's what they want you to believe. Um, there's one way to find out, Bob. We can talk about it in the parrot room. Um, have we reached our limit that 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 time of the week where we hi- hype all the? Uh oh, there's somebody at the door. Yes, what? Oh, this is great TV. I hope it's a SWAT. Team. Hello. Please make this a SWAT team. No, I think it's probably. You want me to find out? I think it's just Amazon left the package. But hang on. Okay, I'll say some things while you're gone. Yeah. So um, I am going to talk about. Let you know, I'm on tenterhooks. Uh, evil in the pair room, but there's a show called Evil that was uh, uh, originally on CBS, then on Paramount streaming, but also the concept of evil. It raises questions about the concept of evil, and I want to talk to Mickey about the concept of evil and kind of flesh out his conception of evil. That's one thing we'll be talking about. Um, I could say more things about. Oh, Tyree Nichols. Damn it. I meant to talk about it in this. Okay, so so you know, the the uh the guy who was killed by police in, in Memphis. I definitely have some things to say about that. Uh so um and uh what you know well I'm back. afraid it was just a UPS man dropping off my new hose for my centralized vacuum system. Well, that's important. I'm glad. So um and, you know, it was basically the opening for a porn movie. The UPS when it comes to the door. <laughs> but it didn't happen. Have to, so. you, uh, I'm, uh, I'm not sure what you mean, but we, you can elaborate on that in the parrot room. What else are you going to talk about? <laughs> um, uh, 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 there's a bunch of stuff. We covered uh, actually quite a lot of it in, in this regular thing for free. We didn't withhold, we didn't hold back. Uh there's a crazy, Matt Gates has a crazy debt ceiling proposal to work test Medicaid. Uh, we could talk about AI. I have, I have a question for yeah. you about AI. Yeah, I'd like to we, talk about it. We could talk about Twitter. Bob, I did something really exciting yesterday. What? I edited a tweet. Oh, can you do? Oh, you can do that if you have a blue. If you I can do that. Check, I can do that, Bob. I don't, know, I don't think you can do that. Um, I, I can because and, I can actually afford the eight dollars a month, Mickey. We're both so special. I got Twitter stamps from the government. My eight dollars a month is subsidized now. Well, I'll think about um, buying a blue check. And they're thinking of work yet. testing the Twitter stamps, but I don't think I'd pass that the would, work. That test. would. Be, you could use a little character. <laughs> I, would, and that I, would I would build be, it. I don't think. I don't think doing this podcast with you would satisfy that. Matt Gates's work test. Um, uh, there's uh, a point to make about uh, Bob about mm. entanglement and the, cra- the, the, the crazy essay I sent you about how quantum mechanics. Crazy essay I sent you about how quantum mechanics is causing us to rethink the whole nature of the universe. I'm always up for discussing quantum physics. Okay. I just uh, uh, I recently quantum physics. Uh, sorry. Anyway, it um. I thought it was interesting, an interesting uh, take, as they say. Um, not that I know anything about it. Um, uh, the question, there's a, a point about um, uh, why don't care that it's talk about hope anymore. And could we, could we have, a, a, you know, my friend, my friend John Ellis, who I always mention, uh, wrote a piece saying you would never. A candidate would never run on keep hope alive, uh, or or make you know uh, make it a, a a place called hope. Uh, what what Clinton talked about. I'm not sure that's true, and and but there is a sort of dearth. There is a lane 
as he puts it in the primaries, the hope lane. The hope lane. There's always a hope who, lane. Of course, who's Clinton, was actually, the hope lane? Clinton was actually uh, born or grew up in a town actually called Hope, so he had right. an advantage. But I've driven through Hope. Have you? Or driven past So many hope. of us, so many of us have been, been through Hope. You probably walked and, past Hope with your daughter writing poetry. Uh, she was um, over there. Um, uh, and, and also, I, I have a, a point about uh, why I'm not in the uh, uh, the uh, McKay Coppins fan club and why I'm generally not in the Atlantic fan club. Yeah, you've never been a fan of his. I like him. He's my he's favorite. He's obviously a nice guy and a good writer, but I'm still not in the fan club. He's my favorite Mormon journalist. Walter Kern does not take that lightly. <laughs> is uh, Walter is he? He wrote a piece in the New Republic about his Mormon upbringing, yeah. I think he's abandoned. I think McKay Coppins is a practicing Mormon. Okay, okay. Well, that's it for me. Yeah, I mentioned a couple of things while you were getting your tube. Uh, Oh, okay. Well, I'll... I'll, You can tell me in the break what they were. I can also mention that uh, in uh, the Non-Zero newsletter, you'll find uh, my elaboration on a couple of things we've discussed this time, and also some updates on the, the Cold War uh cold war ii the one we're in and uh and then in the previous uh issue some more stuff about bill burns and and how he sized up uh putin back in 2008 and i i don't know i may talk about it in the parrot room if you're interested uh but anyway par- uh, mm-hmm. patreon.com oh. slash patreon.com slash parrot room okay, is the place you find that and this is the aforementioned parrot that you just yeah we're going to talk about war <laughs> Good God, y'all. What is what it is good, it good for? for? Absolutely. What is it good for? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely not. Nothing. Okay. All right. You know why that's relevant? The guy that wrote that song died this week. Oh, did he? Barrett Strong, Bar- apparently. It was, was Barrett a, or Barry? Was it? I think Barrett. I hmm. may be wrong. Uh, but he wrote War and, uh, and a song that. Whenever anybody records it, it's a number one song. What is that song? We'll find out in exactly the parrot room. Okay, we'll see you there. Yeah.